Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really awesome guest today uh, involved in creating uh, a better tomorrow for many people out there. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Roland Carlson, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Immune Express, which is a Seattle-based uh, molecular diagnostic company. They're committed to improving the outcomes uh, for patients suspected of having sepsis. Uh, and their FDA cleared septicite technology uh, is focused on rapidly quantifying uh, from whole blood uh, specific molecular markers of a patient's immune system, the so-called health response, uh, and is the first of the kind tool that uses host immune response to ultimately differentiate uh, patients that are having sepsis from other conditions like uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and ultimately the goal uh, detecting um, the sepsis earlier allows for faster, more accurate uh, diagnostics and ultimately uh, proper treatment. Um, Dr. Carlson brings over 25 years of, of experience on the commercial business development uh, and, and general management side of the biotech space. Uh, he recently served as uh, president and CEO of WaferGen Biosystems, a uh, genomics analysis company. Uh, prior to that, was uh, with the uh, CEO of Surigen, which is a privately held molecular diagnostics company. And prior to that, uh, spent the last uh, about 20 year period at uh, various levels of senior management, Abbott Labs including as vice president general manager of the vices um, like your diagnostic business. Uh, he also along the way was responsible for business development activities, licensing, strategic planning, uh, as well as important roles at uh, uh, in the pediatric and women's health division of Ross uh, part of Abbott Labs and also ran Abbott's global uh, custom biopharma and specialty generics business. Uh, Dr. Carlson graduated with a PhD in botany and plant physiology from Southern Illinois University. Then he did his postdoc work at uh, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Research Institute in uh, Fort Pierce, Florida. A lot of very interesting themes to get into today. Um, we're honored to have him. Uh, Dr. Roland Carlson, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. All right, it's a pleasure. It's it's great having you, Ali. I um, you know, before we get involved in in, in sepsis and sepsisite, um, you know, I love starting off by hearing a little bit more about uh, our guest background. And I have to say, I, I as people watch the show know, I, I sort of go into sort of the early research days of what you were involved in, and I'd love to start the show off back in 1984 because I pulled up a copy of. The Distribution, Periodicity, and Culture of Benthic Epiphytic Dinoflagellates in Cigatera Endemic Region of the Caribbean. And um, I was just reading Craig Venter's <laughs> recent book where um, a bunch of them, on their, as they were boating around the world, uh, ate some tropical fish and got really sick with this stuff. <laughs> and I'd love to hear the early story about how you, you focused on this during your dissertation. Well, you you dug pretty deep, Ira, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, I was always I, I, I've been a scuba diver and and, and grown up by the sea, you know, uh, all my life, and um, I really was interested in in tropical marine biology. And uh, we one thing led to another. We were able to get an FDA grant to study uh, what was a, a fish uh, a toxin and a poison, a ciguatera, which was f fish poisoning, uh, which is found in uh, pristine tropical marine. 
um, waters around the world. And it was very odd because it was something that nobody really knew what the origin of this was. And the fish looked perfectly healthy. And Craig Vintner and company, and I can tell you many, many stories of, of physicians and others who had caught fish, uh, had eaten them. And then there was a pretty severe neurotoxic uh, response uh, to, to that. And that's called, called ciguatera. And my work uh, that had been sponsored by the FDA was to be able to uh, try to find what the origin of, of that was. And so we received a grant to be able to um, look, uh, you know, in the British Virgin Islands uh, for what were uh, origins of, of this toxicity. And we knew where there were certain reefs that were hot spots. Uh, where uh, fish were known by the locals to be toxic and others that weren't. And so we would characterize what was the difference between those reefs. And um, one thing led to another while we were diving all over the British Virgin Islands, and it was very uh, a lot of fun. What we found was is that in relatively shallow uh, water uh, that there were um, very small microscopic uh, organisms called dinoflagellates, uh, which under SEM, uh, scanning electron microscopy, looks very cool, um, that actually produce some very severe neurotoxins. And so we identified um, a number of uh, of them, isolated them, identified what the, the toxins were, and verified that indeed they were uh, causative agents of, of, of ciguatera. Awesome. Now, I, I, as I said, I really enjoyed reading that, and you know, love to see where, see where, see where this journey begins. But really cool stuff. Um, but you know, moving moving into sepsis now, because clearly, um, here we have a uh, a significant condition um, in terms of um, you know, sort of runaway, not just inflammation, but just failure of a lot of our body systems um, when we have uh, exposure to um, microbes, uh, things they make like endotoxins. I was looking at some of the uh, the data on, on sepsis now, um, the 1.7 million adults in the U.S. diagnosed, about quarter million deaths every year. And, and just you know, thinking back, you know, um, from my own time in biotech, you know, sepsis was always one of those things that uh, gave biotech a pretty hard time, thinking back to the days of Senecor and Zoma, and a lot of those companies were trying to make antibodies against endotoxin. And you know, not not a lot came out of the pipelines. Talk about sort of where we are um, as we approach 2024, because still a major unmet medical need. Uh, let's put it that way. Well, sticking sticking with the marine analogy, I mean, there's been a lot of ships that have gone on the rocks and trying to yeah. uh, be therapeutic associated with yeah. uh, with, with sepsis. Um, you know, Lily put a lot of. Uh, time and effort into Zegris, which was FDA cleared, but ultimately was not successful. And I think that, you know, in large part, if you th think about it, the diagnosis of sepsis is is not good at all. And when, if you look at highly trained critical care physicians uh, and they say for for certain, we think that this, this person has sepsis, 43% of the time, uh, they're not, uh, uh, they don't have sepsis. And so they're, they're, treat they're treating for sepsis. So if you think about therapeutics, just to back 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 up, mm -hmm. if you're doing enrollment for a therapeutic to treat sepsis, and about fifty percent of your patients are thought to be septic, but they're not, you can only imagine what the statistical outcome of that trial is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very that in and of itself is 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 a problem. Uh, but you know, sepsis just for the audience's sake is really a you know, life threatening organ dysfunction. Uh, that's due to a dysregulated human host response to an infection, uh, which essentially means that your 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 body is overreacting uh, to a pathogen. Uh, you, it goes down basically what is a cytokine a cascade. You mm -hmm. uh, you could start having um, uh, blood cell blood blood leaking from capillaries or and ultimately organ dysfunction. By the time you get to organ dysfunction, it's very easy to determine if you have sepsis, but that means your late stage and the, the very high morbidity and mor mortality that's associated with it. And the challenge uh, for uh, uh, for sepsis is really the early diagnosis. And if you can do early diagnosis, then you can do earlier in interventions. And that has shown uh, that you can dramatically improve outcomes 
uh, that, that that are associated. And if you look at, you know, really uh, as far as sepsis diagnosis, uh, it hasn't changed a lot even over the past, you know, um, you know, uh, decades. Uh, the gold standard has been basically trying to identify uh, what the pathogen is, and that's been uh, very much focused on bacterial pathogens, uh, of which uh, the industry is dependent on a very billion dollar uh, sort, sort of equipment and laboratory methodology for interrogating blood cultures. Uh, but you don't get a result for that until 24 hours after the, uh, you know, the initial diagnosis. And so as each hour goes by, uh, the probability, if you do have sepsis, the probability of uh, mortality goes up by 8% per hour. So 24 hours is is not pointing to a very good, very, very, very good outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, as I mentioned, is the focus has been bacterial, but the other pathogens that can cause uh, sepsis are viral, as evidenced yeah. by the, the COVID-19 pandemic, in which 30% of uh, patients that passed in the hospital uh, really um, passed because of COVID-19 viral, viral sepsis, right. um, and which increased, by the way, the mortality during the pandemic from about the 270,000 uh, deaths, unfortunately, in the U.S. to about 450,000, uh, and then also fungal uh, infection as well. Right. Right. And, and just say a couple of words about um, the, the need to differentiate uh, sepsis from you know what I mentioned in the the your bio sort of this uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome because that by itself is sort of this interesting little cytokine storm thing that's over here it seems pretty nasty as well but uh, the purpose uh, and the benefit to why we need to keep those things separate if you could just say a couple words about that yeah I mean. <clears throat> So systemic inflammatory response or SIRS is really something that looks at the early stage very much like sepsis. Mm -hmm. uh, there are signs that, and, and you know, it can be fever, uh, tachycardia, other uh, increased uh, white, white blood cell count, et cetera, along those lines. And what that it is actually an ephemeral type of body response. So it looks like sepsis, uh, but it does not have a, a, a pathogen associated. So it's really systemic inflammatory response without a pathogen. And so up front, you know, the physician is looking and assessing a, a patient and many times are trying to determine, well, is this a patient that has SIRS, no pathogen associated, kind of looks like sepsis overall, or does it have, have sepsis? That happens at the very, very early stage, and it's been very, very difficult to be able to uh, differentiate that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Perfect. So Enter Immune Express, um, you know, you, uh, as mentioned, your molecular diagnostics company, you have you know, the, this FDA cleared uh, septicite technology um, that, that looks at whole blood. And, you know, again, I was sort of looking through, um, you know, some of the materials on what you're looking at. Um, and it seems like, you know, you're, um, and I saw some papers out there on sort of the peripheral blood RNAs and, and a sort of a wide range of um, uh, different markers that say, hey, uh, yes, the, this this is sepsis. Talk, I mean, uh, Take us into the company a little bit about sort of the history and 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 the development of this technology, and a little bit about sort of what um, you know some of this uh, I'll say this cocktail uh, of biomarkers means. Obviously, there's inflammation and coagulation and all other things happening uh, in the peripheral blood. What specifically are you looking for in terms of this fingerprint that says, "Yeah, this is sepsis, and we got to do X." Well, uh, the company actually was uh, working with a consortium uh, in in uh, Europe, uh, the Netherlands, and they are very interested in in looking at hum the human host response uh, to uh, pathogen and sepsis, mm -hmm. and whether or not uh, we could uh, find biomarkers that were associated with distinguishing between SIRS uh, and 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 sepsis. And we worked with uh, the University of Amsterdam and others uh, that had a consortium of the best annotated, uh, basically a sample uh, bank of sepsis patients uh, mm -hmm. that was preserved and known uh, with known outcomes. Uh, what we did was we were uh, really having an unbiased look at what the uh, uh, gene expression uh, technology could be associated uh, with patients that had sepsis or did not. 
And so we actually looked with uh, early on with microarrays and then with next gen sequencing and found uh, hundreds of genes that were associated with the either upregulated or downregulated associated with sepsis or, or SIRS uh, in, in, in that regard. Uh, so the company uh, then said, well, you want to be able to take that and 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 distill that down to something that could be a, a more rapid test and something that were, what were the genes that matter? And we actually distilled that down to 100 genes and to, uh, to, then to about 12 genes. And and ultimately, in the, in the FDA product that we have, there's two genes uh, that are driving the signal that are associated with it. And these these genes are are expressed on white blood cells and human white, white blood cells. And we found that uh, one of those genes, uh, uh, plaque eight, mm -hmm. um, which is associated um, uh, with, with with sepsis, is uh, way overexpressed if there, you have systemic inflammatory response with a pathogen. And the other one, PLA two G seven, is uh, basically uh, downregulated associated with that. And then if you have SIRS and there's no pathogen at all, plaque 8 doesn't move at all. It's very stable um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in that regard. So what we measure is the different uh, differential expression between those, those two genes. And what we've been able to do is come up with a probability score uh, up from low to high, and we call that the, the SEPTA score. Um, that's uh, associated with uh, uh, prediction of early detection of sepsis. Mm -hmm. And I know there's also some papers um, uh, that the group was involved in, specifically focused on on pediatric um, uh, sepsis. Is that does that have a different sort of profile or fingerprint compared to adult sepsis? Are there unique challenges uh, specifically related to the pediatric population and this condition? Well, one but one has to be cognizant with, uh, and certainly in pediatrics, is that uh, their um, um, kids, neonates, their immune system isn't fully developed, and so right. therefore, it's 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 different perhaps than 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 adults. Uh, we did two studies uh, with Seattle Children's Hospital to de uh, determine if our genes were associated um, with pediatric sepsis, and it was really a contrived study at the time where what we were looking at was. Uh, first off, uh, kids that did have sepsis down to you know one year one one years old, uh, and then what would be a artificial SIRS in that regard. And in this case, uh, these were uh, 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 kids who had open heart surgery um, that would uh, after which they would definitely have symptoms of SIRS because uh, trauma uh, can can certainly um, a surgery surgery trauma can be associated with that. And could we uh, come up and and make that determination? We had very high sensitivity and specificity associated with that. But also, you know, we also did a a proteomic study uh, that right, was associated right. with that. And so we were looking specifically at aptamers, which are peptides that attach to uh, nucleic acids. Uh, and we found actually a very interesting signature of a hundred. Uh, uh, different um, uh, aptamers, you know, that were associated with distinguishing between SIRS and, and sepsis. Uh, we were very intrigued with that, but the practical implementation of that uh, from a diagnostic standpoint is such where this is where the technology, uh, while the biology is there, the signal is there, the technology is limited by which you could be able to do that on a practical basis because it would take a long time uh, to have a, have, have a result. Mm -hmm. And so what we've focused on is our, our gene technology, which uh, again was uh, tech you know, technically limited because if we were having this discussion maybe seven years ago, uh, the technology would uh, require, you know, three different uh, clean rooms uh, for amplification, uh, detection, isolation, et cetera, like that of the genes. Um, and then ultimately uh, uh, having an output, which would be eight to, you know, 12 hours later right. in that regard. Uh, what we have done uh, and what is FDA cleared is we've uh, distilled down and hopefully your audience can can see this this cartridge here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is basically a, a molecular lab in the uh, palm of my hand. This is these nice. three three rooms are in my hand. All the reagents, uh, the ability to uh, uh, amplify, uh, extract, amplify, purify, uh, all are in here. And all one would do is would be able to uh, put a a mill of blood in in uh, mm -hmm. this chamber here, and you're able to close this up, 
put this in a DVD type tray, and then one hour walk away, and one hour later you'd have a result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I, I enjoy seeing uh, <laughs> the uh, the miniaturization and sort of the uh, the potential of some of these tools. That, that that's really awesome. Um, and and you know proteomics and aptamer detection could, could go down that route too. So that's yeah. where you know, the more we understand the biology that's associated with that and the mechanisms that are associated with it, then we develop the techniques to be able to uh, detect that and then utilize them on a practical basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's interesting, Raleigh. At the at the very beginning of COVID, I I uh, had the opportunity to host uh, a guest from DARPA that was working on um, uh, their echo technology, looking at sort of the epigenetics in the very early stages of the disease. And I found it interesting that just you know a couple months ago, I think you guys published on. Uh, sort of the stratification of, of COVID severity, again, using your technologies, looking at novel host response. Um, say, say a couple of words about this as well, because I, I think this, um, you know, obviously we think about, again, you were saying before, you know, COVID is one thing, but no, um, yes, there's a virus, but it could trickle down and affect their, uh, at, the, at sort of the genetic level, our immune systems very differently depending on, you know, pharmacogenomics, toxicogenomics, whatever you want to call it. Um, say a couple of words about this work, if you would. I think it's kind of interesting. Well, this was work that we did both in the U.S. and and in Europe. And, and we, if you recall, during the pandemic, you would have COVID positive uh, people showing up at the hospital, and it was very difficult to determine whether or not uh, they would uh, progress to severe disease or not. And it was really unknown why, you know, at that mm -hmm. at that point in time. And there was some indication um, that IL-6, for example, well known in the cytokine you know, cascade, uh, could give uh, some some indications of those who would pr proceed uh, to uh, disease severe, severity and ultimately end up in the I, I, ICU, but very poor sensitivity and set, uh, specificity, like in the in the low seventies and and sixties, you know, in in that regard. So we actually looked at what our our gene signatures uh, for patients that would present in hospitals that are COVID pos uh, positive, uh, and actually do our test at that point in time, and well over two hundred patients. And we could see a very strong um, predictor of severe disease but, uh, uh, folks that could would end up in the ICU with, and on a, on a ventilator uh, three days later. And we could see that two to three days before that would that would happen. So we were present, we, we, we presented this actually to the FDA as a for an EUA. Uh, to be helping as far as determining whether or not, you know, how to triage patients, you know, at the at the get go from uh, hospital hospital presentations. We weren't successful at, at getting that EUA, but it really gave and, and determined what the power of the early prediction capability of this type of of technology does. Because you're actually your hum the human host response is is a very strong signal you know, with basically uh, a low copy number of a pathogen that is there. And to do direct uh, pathogen detection, you have to wait till you have a sufficient copy numbers to be able to determine if if, there, if the bacteria or, or, or the vir virus is there. But this human host response happens earlier and is a very strong signal, you know, that one uh, can take advantage of. Where, um, where, where else is, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, there's, uh, again, sort of ho hopping onto PubMed and looking around, there's it seems like there's a lot of other applications here. Not to say that sep sepsis is huge, of course, and this is clearly something you know you have the FDA uh, approval and all that. And uh, what um wh what else is is potential here? Because you know I see papers on Clostridium difficile and asthma and sort of everything in between, everything, you know, inflammation, uh, host immune response, you know, it, it connected to so much stuff nowadays, um, underlying sort of uh, disease and, you know, chronic degenerative diseases. Uh, where else is all this going? I think it has a lot of potential elsewhere too. Well, you know, purple gene analysis and expression has been, you know, uh, in the literature, certainly for early detection, diagnosis, pro, you know, pro, prognosis, for example, and a number of diseases. Obviously, we've been talking about infectious diseases, uh, but in, in cancer, uh, yep. in transplant uh, uh, rejection, you mentioned some other ones uh, that are associated with inflammatory responses. Sure. And if you think about the theory behind behind is the utility of 
peripheral gene expression is 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 the white blood cells really carry messages from all parts of the body, right? Yep. And so, um, and so as as re- and those those messages uh, are in our case we're focused on the uh, mRNA expression of those, but it's also proteomic as well. And so the white cells blood cells can you know report on the status of a, a potential disease state, you know, in in a common sort of um, you know, uh, detection, um, uh, uh, vehicle. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, you, you mentioned a couple, I mean, once, if you look at for a cancer, you know, for example, you have, you know, ter- circulating tumor cells, uh, that are associated with, you also have white, white blood cells or naked M- mRNA and DNA, uh, that, that can be measured. Uh, one interesting, uh, if tumor of unknown origin, uh, that is yep. associated, you have, uh, basically, uh, you'll have a patient presents. So they might have a, a, a tumor uh, that uh, associated with uh, pancreatic cancer or melanoma, but at that time you don't know that. Yep. And if you're going to be treating, you know that that patient, you really want to make be, make sure it's really the underlying cause of that tumor may not be the one uh, that is threatening your life. It's actually the pancreatic cancer that's threatening your life. And you want to be able to 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 determine that, and then have the appropriate therapies that are associated. And there's some very cool therapies that are emerging uh, uh, for that. Um, and you know, the historically, if you look in cancer. Uh, with the uh, advent of Gleevec, where what we were measuring, this is right. for chronic, you know, uh, you know, chronic leukemia is associated with this myelogenous, myelogenous leukemia. You know, the before the a therapy, which was associated with uh, uh, basically a uh, translocation of the BCR able gene, you know, the uh, diagnosis of this uh, was uh, pretty poor with the outcome uh, three years out. And with these therapies now, and having the diagnostics associated with it, um, you know your your outcome is just as good as you and I sitting here, you know, at this point yeah. in time uh, with with, uh, with with Gleevec. But you know the fact that you can't get to the origin of of where where did this actually metastasis come from? Uh, you can get that through you know, a per, a peripheral you know um, blood cell analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, Another infectious disease uh, example is uh, tuberculosis, and yep. certainly WHO has been trying to have a, a, a you know a campaign to eradicate TB. Uh, there's um, uh, the challenge associated with that. There's it's one thing of having active TB, TB, but there's latent carriers of TB uh, right. that don't express that uh, o- overall. Uh, and and there has been a three gene uh, blood test that has uh, been developed uh, that's actually measuring uh, mRNA, you know, from peripheral blood, sure. and uh, that is not only good about uh, diagnosing TB if it's active or or not with high sensitivity specificity, but then also de- determining uh, patients that are carriers that are likely to ultimately uh, be active TB. Uh, yeah. folks and they're the ones who should be monitored in in that regard and you know this w, who had set what the standards uh, had to be it had to be something that was greater than 75 percent sensitivity and specificity to have value you know in the world population and this test has as as great you know like 85 to 90 percent sensitivity and specificity mm-hmm. so that's a, a a great example of of, of, of that yeah, so I, I, I think that it, you know, we talked about the technology. I mean, so the, the again, the biology is there. The the signals are there. It's how can we uh, narrow that down and put that in a practical technology platform? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought up the TB example because you got me. I I remember one of the thing I want to ask you about because I thought it, we we've been doing a lot of shows lately on um on antimicrobial resistance, and I, I know one of the uh, poster sessions I saw a press release. It was a poster session I think you did in in Europe or something like that, and you were specifically talking about um uh, the fact that just antimicrobial stewardship is a big, is a big part of this AMR problem that's coming our way as a society. And I thought that was, uh, you mentioned TB, but thinking just in terms of just general antibiotic use and understanding, you know, what, what's going on in this patient, should we give them X, Y, or Z or no antibiotic at all? I thought that was a, uh, a very interesting piece in, in that particular, uh, there was a press release you were talking about, uh, um, 
in that particular case. But uh, well, it, it, it's a real challenge, as you know, and it, it certainly if, 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 you, if your show is focused on that. I mean, the the, the specter of that of antimicrobial yeah. resistance is huge. I mean, yeah. the uh, the uh, if if not controlled, if we don't get the get this under control and we don't have some new ther therapeutics and antibiotics, I mean, and, you know, resistant organisms could be causing more deaths and cancer in, by 2050. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with sepsis, uh, the really the physicians, I mean, we haven't been able to give them good enough tools. They go, when in doubt, we're going to treat and they're going to yeah. do, and they will, and they will try to, you know, they'll, they're going to assume it's a bacterial, uh, uh, cause of agent, and they're going to start uh, treating indiscriminately with, with, with um, antibiotics. But I think with some of the tools like septicide, you can have. I mean, if our, we're, our test is, you know, if, if we're in the high probability range of a test it, it, of our, our score on a on a patient's, you know, most likely there's something else. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's sepsis there. You should be treating right away, right. and perhaps you start with a, a high, you know, with a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic, and then you can be able to tailor that later on with uh, uh, organism specific. But on the other hand, remember, 43 percent uh, of patients are being treated that don't have it. If yeah. we're at a low probability, you should be looking at some other ideology. And and while pay, you know physicians might be reluctant to uh, not give um, uh, antibiotics. They could give an oral antibiotic while they're looking for something else. It doesn't need to be that broad a spectrum um, and look for some other ideology because it, 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 if, if you're on the low end of our test, uh, then high probability of something else that is life-threatening. Yeah, yeah. Really, really cool. Um, what, uh, Riley, what, what else is coming up as we get... Uh, close to 2024. I mean, I know you're, you're out on the sort of the conference circuit a lot, uh, talking yeah. about the technology, um, anything happening in the coming months, uh, other initiatives we should know about, uh, anything I missed, please. Well, you're right. We're doing a conference circuit and we're, um, you know, the, I think that for us, uh, we've been really working a lot in Europe and the U S of so, uh, clinical use cases, you know, for, right. uh, for the test. And so we've, uh, University of Heidelberg. Uh, uh, we've been working with looking at time course evaluations. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, if if you look at uh, in in the U.S., uh, the number one cause of readmission, a thirty day readmission to a hospital is 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 a a patient that was uh, septic released and they came back and they had sepsis and. Mm -hmm. And so looking at, at discharge of patients and trying to prevent that readmission rate, which, by the way, the hospitals have to eat all the cost uh, yeah. associated with that. Uh, we've expanded our technology uh, and we'll be uh, making this available uh, early next year. Um, it, and by having not only the test sepsis rapid, which differentiates between surge and sepsis, uh, but that all on the same cartridge, we have a signature that differentiates as far as whether or not it's a bacterial cause or a viral okay. cause. Mm -hmm. And therefore, then you get into a situation where, yes, I know, okay, there's sepsis, it's bacterial, it, I should be using those antibiotics, but if it's viral of origin, those antibiotics aren't going to be of any utility to you, you yeah. know, in, that, in, that, in that case uh, at all. And of course, we're expanding our, our registrations. Um, and so uh, we have registrations in Europe and in the U.S., but then we're looking at expanding those in Asia as well. Really excellent. No, exciting, um, major, major unmet uh, medical need, to say the least. And I'm um, just uh, very excited to see someone having success at this level with the uh, what is, as we said at the beginning, has been a real problem overall for uh, the industry, for patients, of course. Um, really, really great stuff. Um, uh, for everybody who is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks uh, or watching on our YouTube channel. Uh, again, you've been listening to Dr. Roland Carlson, Chief Executive Officer of Immune Express, doing really amazing things on the molecular diagnostics front to improve the outcomes of patients uh, with sepsis uh, and many other conditions as well. Um, Raleigh, I, I wanna thank you for 
taking the time to come talk to us for a little while, um, explaining what you're up to. Obviously, thank you for all the millions out there um, that require this, for what you're doing. And uh, as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create this better tomorrow for so many people via what you do. Really a great story. Ira, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation. Great talking to you.